Hello and welcome to the S4 Summer Showcase. My name is Mark Thompson and I have got some amazing space imagery to show you and some experiments that will blow your mind. This is your virtual guided tour of the universe. For millions of years, our ancestors watched the sky using just their eyes. They saw the sun and moon and stars pretty much as we see them today, and would see them rise in the east and set in the west in just the same way. Ancient astronomers noticed that some of the stars seemed to move against the background of non-moving stars. They were given the name planets from the Greek word for wanderers, planetae, because they seemed to wander among the background of stars but we know them today as Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. But it's not surprising that our astronomer ancestors came to the conclusion that the Earth was at the centre of the entire universe, because everything seemed to move in a path around us. The first model of the universe was referred to as the Ptolemaic model after Greek mathematician Ptolemy, but was also known as the geocentric model because the Earth was thought to be at its centre. But there were problems with that idea. On occasions, astronomers of the day noticed that planets like Mars would sometimes move backwards across the sky, which shouldn't happen if the Earth was at the centre. The simple solution was to replace the Earth with the Sun. The heliocentric model was born, and it was named after Nicolaus Copernicus, who came up with the idea. Another observation, or rather series of observations, were made in the early 1600s by the Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei, but before he could make these observations, it required the invention of the telescope. Many people think that the telescope was invented by Galileo, but it was a Dutch spectacle maker called Hans Lippershey who came up with the idea. He was treating a customer who was suffering with short-sightedness, and whilst arranging lenses, he realised that if they were in a certain alignment, that they would magnify distant objects. The telescope was born. That was back in 1608. The first telescopes magnified objects by an amazing three times, making objects look just three times bigger. Galileo took the idea and made a telescope that magnified about 20 times, and it was through that instrument that he made all of his discoveries. He discovered that the moon was covered in craters, that Saturn had rings, and crucially, that Jupiter had moons all of its own. Previously, it was accepted that everything orbited the Earth. That was the divine way. But the discovery of the moons of Jupiter showed that objects could orbit around other objects, not just the Earth. If Jupiter had moons in orbit around it, then maybe the Earth wasn't so special after all. Today's telescopes are far more powerful, with even amateur instruments capable of magnifying several hundred times and enabling amateur astronomers to take part in real astronomical research. Professional telescopes, by comparison, are massive, with the largest astronomical telescope on Earth measuring 10.4 metres across in La Palma in Spain. There's a problem with using Earth-based telescopes to study the night sky. They have to look through the atmosphere. Now, the atmosphere is wonderful for you and I, because without it, we wouldn't survive, but it's a problem for astronomers. The atmosphere is a shell of gas, on average, 100 kilometres thick, made up of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and a few other gases. But as starlight passes through this ever-moving blanket surrounding the Earth, it gets disturbed, causing images to become a little bit more blurry than they could be. But that's not the only problem caused by the atmosphere. It plays havoc with observations in other wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum is a group of seven types of radiation, including radio waves, visible light, and X-rays. They can travel like waves on the ocean, even through space. The seven types of radiation are grouped by the lengths of their waves, which gives them different properties or behaviours. You've all seen a part of the electromagnetic spectrum without even realising it. We see rainbows because light from the sun gets separated out into its individual colours by tiny drops of water. The colours of the rainbow are just the visible part of the spectrum. It continues beyond the red end that we can see through to infrared, microwave and radio waves, and then extends beyond the violet end through ultraviolet, X-rays and then gamma rays. 
Objects in the universe clearly give off visible light because we can see them, but they also give off differing amounts of radiation from the electromagnetic spectrum. If we want to fully understand objects in the universe, then we need to study them in all wavelengths. Wavelength is the length of a wave. It's measured from the peak or the top of one wave to the peak of the next. A great analogy is an orchestra playing a piece of music. If you listen to just the string instruments or just the wind instruments, then you will only hear a portion of the full piece. You have to listen to all the instruments of the orchestra to really appreciate the music. In astronomy, we must study objects in all wavelengths of light to fully understand them. To enable us to achieve these observations, we have telescopes that can study the universe in all the wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. Some of them are placed up into space because the atmosphere blocks the radiation from reaching the surface. Others, like the Hubble Space Telescope, are there to give them a much sharper view of the universe. We, of course, live on planet Earth, and Earth is just one of eight of the major planets in our solar system. We orbit the Sun at a distance of about 150 million kilometers. And I say about, on average, it's 150 million kilometers because in December, we're closer to the sun at a point in time uh, that we call the perigee, and we are further away from the sun in June at a point we call the apogee. Now, you might be surprised to realize that we're closer to the sun in the winter and further away from the sun in the summer. But actually, in the Northern Hemisphere, we experience the summer months because the Earth is tilted on its axis. So in the summer months, as we perceive them in June, we're further away from the sun, but the Northern Hemisphere of the Earth is tilted towards the sun, which gives us that experience of nice warm weather. Now, the sun is just an average star. There's nothing particularly spectacular about it at all. It's nearer to us, which makes it so very important in our lives, but as stars go, it's very, very average. It's got a surface temperature, I'll talk about the surface of the sun in a few moments. It's got a surface temperature of about six and a half thousand degrees, about 15 million degrees in the core, and its diameter is about 1.4 million kilometers, which makes it sound quite a remarkable place, and of course it is, but as far as the stars go, it's pretty average. There are some stars that are much larger than our own sun, and some stars which are much, much smaller. Some are much cooler and some are much hotter. Now the sun, like all stars, began its life in a gas cloud. We call these large gas clouds in space nebulae, Latin for the word cloud, and all stars begin their lives in these large gas and dust clouds. Now, if you take a balloon, uh, and you may have done this in parties, if you take a balloon and you rub it on your hair, then you can actually build up quite a bit of electrostatic force. Electrostatic force or charge is the electric charge that accumulates or builds up on an object. This happens when an object loses or gains charged particles called electrons, for example, because of friction. You might see that it causes my hair to stand up if I move the balloon around. Another great example of the electrostatic force is seen in a Van de Graaff machine and Van de Graaff generators are wonderful because what they do is they generate loads and loads of tiny little things called electrons. An electron is a small particle with a negative charge. They're one of the particles which atoms are made from. Inside an atom, electrons orbit or move around the central nucleus. And those electrons collect on the glass sphere of a Van de Graaff machine. And as you can see from this young girl during one of my science shows, as she touches the Van de Graaff machine, all of those electrons rush over to her hair, in fact they cover her body, and her hair becomes negatively charged. And as it becomes negatively charged, all those electrons try and push away from all the other electrons. So the electrostatic force is sort of a force between the atoms, and it's that force which starts the collapse of one of these large gas clouds into what will eventually form a star. Now as those, those clumps of material which start to clump together from the electrostatic force start to get larger, as they get larger, then the force of gravity starts to take hold. And when the force of gravity take hold, then the thing gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, at the center of these concentrations of material in the gas cloud, the pressures are so intense that hydrogen atoms crash together to produce helium atoms and a tiny bit of heat and a tiny bit of light. 
and a star is born. And that's how our sun will have formed about five billion years ago. It's how all stars form in the universe. So we can see the sun. As the sun shines down upon us, then what we see, and I have a word or two about the safety aspect of observing the sun in a moment, but what we see is the visible layer of the sun. The sun is made up of gas, more accurately plasma, which is electrically charged gas, but a particular layer of the sun gives off visible light. And it's that layer, the photosphere, that we see when we look at the sun. Now, if you do look at the sun safely, uh, I'll tell you how to do that in a moment, then you can see sunspots. And sunspots are, they're not a magnetic disturbance in the visible layer of the sun. Now, the sun's got a magnetic field, just like the Earth has got a magnetic field. And because the sun is made up of plasma, which is electrically charged gas, then as the sun rotates in different areas of the sun, rotate at different speeds, then the magnetic field lines get dragged around with the material, with the plasma. And eventually they get tighter and tighter and eventually they snap and they burst through the surface of the sun. And we see that as sunspots. We get sunspots in pairs. So you'll see two sunspots uh, appear on the sun. Sometimes the sun goes through a period of great activity and you see lots of sunspots. And other times we end up with really quiet sun and there's not a lot going on at all. Now, as far as observing the sun is concerned, it's very, very dangerous. What you shouldn't do is ever look directly at the sun. Even with the naked eye, it's a bad idea. You can damage your eyesight. Using telescopes and binoculars in particular is bad because not only do you magnify the object you're looking at through binoculars and telescope, but you also magnify the energy. And if you point a telescope at the sun, then all of that energy is being magnified and concentrated into your eye and that is very very dangerous there are records of people having gone blind looking at the sun through a telescope and i've got a wonderful demonstration of why it's a bad idea to study the sun through a telescope and i did this with a pig's eye I held it to the eyepiece of a telescope pointing at the sun and this was the result you can see the smoke coming off and as you'll see in a moment you can see a hole in the cornea that was burned through the cornea by the energy from the sun. And there was also a dark patch on the retina, the bit that forms the image in the eye. So you will absolutely burn a hole through your eye if you try and observe the sun through a telescope or binoculars. Do not do it, very, very dangerous. There are safe ways of observing the sun. For example, you could project the image. So you point the telescope at the sun, hold a piece of paper or card about, a, about, about half a meter away from the eyepiece, and you'll see an image of the sun projected onto the piece of paper. You don't need to look through it to see it. You can spend money on expensive filters as well that you can look at the sun through, and they are a really good alternative to projection, but make sure they're the right sort of solar filters. Any solar filters that just fit over the eyepiece of the telescope are dangerous. Chuck them in the bin, they're no good to you. But you can, if you're careful, quite satisfactorily and successfully observe our local star in that way. What do the Welsh scientists Arthur May, Isaac Roberts, Alfred Russell Wallace and Hugh Percy all have in common? The answer is that they've all got craters named after them on the moon. Where would you find Marath Vallis? The answer is on Mars. It's a valley which was named after the Welsh word for Mars. Earth is one of eight major planets which orbit around the Sun. They are in order Mercury, Venus and Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, then Neptune. Pluto is not classed as a planet, but we'll come on to that a bit later on. Now we understand very well how the planets move around the Sun and it was in 1609 that Johannes Kepler described his three laws of planetary motion. The first law states that all planets orbit around the Sun in elliptical orbits. The second law states that planets move faster when they're closer to the Sun and slower when they're further away. And finally, law number three states that the time taken for a planet to orbit the Sun 
is proportional to its distance. And that means if we can observe and measure how long it takes for a planet to orbit the sun, we can mathematically calculate its distance. Now that's very useful for us to study and understand the solar system, but we can also use it to calculate distances of the moons around Jupiter, for example, because the laws are still valid. Now using Kepler's laws of planetary motion and Newton's law of gravity, which was described in 1687, we have a very good understanding of how the planets move around the sun. And we can even predict where they're going to be. And that's incredibly useful when it comes to sending rockets around the solar system, because we have to send them to where the planets will be when they arrive. And that can be many years after launch. Now the solar system is broken up into two categories. The inner solar system includes Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. And Mercury is the nearest planet to the Sun at an average distance of 55.7 million kilometers. And one of the rather strange things about Mercury is that its core is shrinking. Now a good analogy, if you take an apple and leave it on your table for a couple of weeks, then you'll find that over the time, the, the skin of the apple will wrinkle up. And the reason the skin of the apple wrinkles up is because the apple is drying up and its core is shrinking. And in the same reason, when we study Mercury, we can see surface features that are the effect of the shrinking core and the surface material of Mercury trying to wrinkle up to accommodate the smaller size of the core. The second planet from the Sun, surprisingly, is actually the hottest, and that's Venus, which orbits the Sun at an average distance of 108.4 million kilometers. Now, the reason Venus is the hottest is because it's surrounded by greenhouse gases. Now, here on Earth, we experience nice warm days because the energy from the Sun warms up the surface of the Earth, which in itself warms the atmosphere. Now, because we don't have too many greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, that heat can escape out into space. But on Venus, the atmosphere is full of greenhouse gases, so the heat from the Sun can't escape. That means that surface temperature on Venus has reached an incredible 500 degrees. Now, if that's not enough to put you off going to Venus, then the atmosphere above you, as you stood on the surface, is pressing down on you. On the surface of the Earth, we say that's one atmospheric pressure, but on Venus, the atmospheric pressure is 90 times as strong, so it's very likely it would crush you. The final reason I highly suggest you don't go to Venus is because high up in the atmosphere, it rains sulfuric acid rain. And that means skin would be dissolved. Now, of course, high up in the atmosphere, you'll be in your spacecraft, so you'll be absolutely fine. But still, the conditions on Venus are very much not conducive to life. Somewhere where life has, of course, evolved is here on planet Earth, 150 million kilometers from the sun, or an average of 150 million kilometers from the sun. Now, one of the key reasons why the conditions are so good here on Earth is the distance of the Earth from the Sun. At this distance, the temperature is just right. We inhabit what's known as the Goldilocks zone. Too close, then it would be too hot, too far away, and it would be too cold for life to evolve. So we're in just the right position in the solar system for life to evolve. That's meant our atmosphere has developed in a way that supports life. Now our atmosphere is made up of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen and a few other bits and pieces mixed in. Now the nitrogen in our atmosphere is by far the more common of the elements, but it's also in you and me. And let me tell you, it's an amazing element. Now if you were to boil a pan of water on your oven, on your oven's hob, it will boil at the surface of the earth at about 100 degrees. But that temperature is based on the pressure from the atmosphere. If you go up a mountain, uh, the atmosphere will be less and therefore the water will boil at a lower temperature. That's why a lot of mountaineers struggle with uh, health if they boil water at high altitude because the temperature of the water never gets hot enough to kill off the bacteria. So different pressures affect how different things boil. Liquid nitrogen doesn't boil at 100 degrees, it boils at minus 196 degrees. And one of my favorite demonstrations is the nitrogen cloud. Now, if you have a dewer, of liquid nitrogen and you pour that into a bucket and then you dump hot water onto it, what do you think is going to happen? Well, the temperature difference between boiling water at 100 degrees and liquid nitrogen at minus 
196 degrees is around 300 degrees. So that means if you dump hot water on liquid nitrogen, as in the liquid nitrogen demonstration, you will get an instant evaporation of the water. As you can see, it gives off quite an amazing effect. Now we're orbited by the moon. We're all very familiar with the moon in our nighttime sky. One of the things I'm sure many of you have recognized is the phases of the moon. Now we see the moon because it reflects sunlight and it's a sphere. So as the moon's position changes with respect to the Earth and the sun, we see different amounts of the illuminated part of the moon. When we see a full moon, we're looking at the fully illuminated portion of the moon. When we see the new moon, we're looking at the, not the dark side because the moon doesn't have a dark side, but we're looking at the portion of the moon where no light is being received by the sun. Now, one of the other very familiar things I'm sure you've all seen on the moon are craters and the larger cousins to the craters, the lunar maria. Now, craters exist because there are pieces of rock flying around the solar system. Those pieces of rock will often hit other objects. For example, we've found evidence of pieces of rock hitting the Earth, massive craters in, for example, Arizona. We've seen evidence on Venus, on Mars, and also on Mercury. So those pieces of rock fly around. When they hit the surface, we call them meteorites, and they produce massive great dents. And that's what we can see covering the surface of the moon. Sometimes, particularly in the past, there have been much larger meteoric impacts on the surface of the moon. And when we have those, the crust can be cracked, allowing molten lava to seep up through the surface, uh, which then fills the crater. And we see that as the darker gray regions that we call Lunar Maria. And in one of those seas on the moon in 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were the first humans to walk on its surface. The final planet that we want to talk about in the inner solar system is Mars. Now people tell you that Mars is rusting and it kind of is true that it is. If you leave a lump of metal, particularly a lump of metal which has got iron inside it, outside in the, uh, in the elements, you'll find that over time the iron will start to rust and that's because the iron in the metal reacts with the oxygen in the atmosphere and it produces a material called iron oxide which is the red dusty material. And Mars is covered in fine powdery iron oxide. And it's not uncommon for uh, global wind storms to whip up on the surface of Mars and cause a lot of that dust to get lifted up and suspended in the atmosphere, meaning we can't see anything on the surface for sometimes a few weeks or even a month or two. There is also a large volcano on Mars called Olympus Mons. It's the largest volcano in the solar system. And there's an incredible valley system called Mariner's Valley or Valles Marineris that's discovered by the Mariner spacecraft. There are also polar caps on Mars, very similar to the polar caps here on the surface of the Earth, but they're made of carbon dioxide ice. Now, one of the discoveries that was made more recently on the surface of Mars by one of the orbiters in orbits around the planet were tiny dark lines that we've called recurring slope lineae that appeared and disappeared on the surface of Mars, often down the sides of valleys and crater walls. Spectroscopic studies, so studying the light coming from those recurring slope lineae, has told us that they're water with a fairly high salt content. What does salt do in water? Well, salt lowers the freezing point of water, and that's meant that even though the surface temperatures on Mars are between 20 degrees and more often than not lower than zero, down to minus 153 degrees, even though it's lower than zero degrees, the water can stay as a liquid. The water is super cooled and it's able to still flow, even though it's lower than zero degrees. And a great demonstration that you can do yourselves is to take a bottle of still mineral water, place it inside your freezer for a few hours, take it carefully out of the freezer, and because there's no impurities in the mineral water, ice cannot form. Ice needs something to start the process of nucleation, which is where the molecules of water start to line up. But if there's no impurities in there, water can't start that freezing or nucleation process. If you take that still mineral water out of your freezer very carefully and then pour it onto an ice cube, you can get an incredible tower of ice form right in front of your eyes. How many 
years ago was a telescope invented. The answer is 411 years ago. On which planet would you be burned like a piece of toast? The answer is Venus. Let's talk now about the outer solar system made up of the giant planets Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. But before we talk about the planets themselves, we need to learn about a new unit of measurement. Because if we use kilometers to describe the distances to the outer planets, the numbers become ridiculously large. Try it for yourselves now. Go and grab a ruler and measure the length of your arm. And what you'll find, if you try and do that in millimeters, it becomes really difficult because you get a really big number of millimeters. So instead, you'd probably measure the length of your arm in centimeters, much more sensible unit of measurement. Now in astronomy, when we describe the distances to the outer planets, we use something called the astronomical unit. And one astronomical unit is equivalent to the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, which is 150 million kilometers. So one astronomical unit is 150 million kilometers. So therefore two astronomical units is the same as 300 million kilometers. And that's a much easier unit to work with. For example, the region which kind of defines the start of the outer solar system is called the asteroid belt. And the asteroid belt is 2.8 astronomical units from the sun. So it's 2.8 multiplied by 150 million kilometers. You can work it out for yourselves. So the asteroid belt is a region in our solar system where when the solar system was forming about four and a half billion years ago, there was a solar planet starting to form there but because of the effects of Jupiter, it actually disrupted that planet from forming and it ended up just staying as a collection of large chunks of rock. Now the largest of those chunks of rocks is 950 kilometers across and it's called Ceres. But compare that to the Earth, which is 12,700 kilometers across, you'll realize that even the largest chunk of rock in the asteroid belt is still actually really quite small. Now I've seen many science fiction movies where daring astronauts flying their spaceships through the asteroid belt as they dodge and dive and try and miss these space rocks that are hurtling straight towards them. But the reality is really quite different because the average gap between the asteroids is about a million kilometers, which means that there's no real risk to any spacecraft trying to fly through them. We've seen that with the Voyager spaceship and the Cassini spacecraft, all of which have gone out to the outer solar system to explore the outer planets, never had any problems traveling through the asteroid belt. Now beyond the asteroid belt is the largest of all the planets in our solar system at a distance of 5.2 astronomical units, which equates to 780 million kilometers from the sun. I'm talking about Jupiter, the largest of all the planets. So large, in fact, it's got a diameter of 140,000 kilometers, so large, that you could fit all of the planets in the solar system inside Jupiter and still have room to spare. It's a massive giant planet. Now I mentioned that it's a gas giant planet and it is. Unlike the planets Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars which have solid surfaces that you could land on, you could walk around, you might not survive but you could walk around. Jupiter, because it's a gas giant, means that if you fly your spaceship to Jupiter, you would simply sink straight through. You would not find any surface to land on. So when we look at Jupiter, we're looking at the top of the gas clouds of the planet. And one of the most well-known features of the planet Jupiter was discovered by Galileo about 400 years ago, and it was called the Great Red Spot. Great because it's big, red because it's red, and spot because it's a spot. But actually, we've learned that it's a hurricane, a hurricane just like the hurricanes we see on the surface of Earth, but this hurricane is a giant. It's three times the size of the Earth, actually just under three times the size of the Earth. It's shrinking very slowly, but it's not shrinking as fast as we expected. So we think it's probably drawing some energy from inside Jupiter itself. But it's a great feature. You can see it with uh, even small amateur telescopes. Something else you can see orbiting around Jupiter with an amateur telescope 
were the Galilean satellites, also discovered by Galileo about 400 years ago. They're called Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And they're joined by even more satellites. We've got one uh, moon in orbit around us. Jupiter has got 53 named satellites in orbit around it, and 26 more satellites waiting to be named. Saturn is the next planet, the sixth planet out from the sun, and it's the first thing I ever saw through a telescope, and it was amazing to see the planet with the ring system against a beautiful velvet black sky got me fascinated on wanting to learn more about the universe. Now, something you can amaze your friends and families, you can't prove me wrong on this, you have to take my word for it, but the density of Saturn is so low that if you could find a bucket of water large enough, Saturn would float. Challenge you to prove me wrong there. One of the things that Saturn is very well known for is the amazing ring system. It's not the only planet that has rings. Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune all have ring systems. And if you've been lucky enough to look at Saturn through a telescope, you might have noticed that those rings seem to have gaps in them. Now, the rings look like some kind of solid disk circling around the planet, but we've learned that the rings are not solid at all. They're made up of billions upon billions of tiny pieces of ice and dust all orbiting around the planet, just like our moon orbits around Earth. And the gaps that we can see in the rings around Saturn are caused by the presence of something called shepherd moons. Now we know that shepherds uh, are the people that control sheep and move them around fields in the countryside, but shepherd moons control the tiny particles in the rings of Saturn, and they produce the rather wonderful structure of the gaps that we can see. And one of the more well-known gaps is called the Cassini division. And like I say, amateur telescopes can certainly pick those up. Not only has Saturn got the shepherd moons, which control the particles in the ring system, but it has got more moons. Of course, all the planets in the outer solar system seem to have a lot of moons. Saturn, at its last count, has got 82 moons. The next planet in orbit around the Sun, the seventh planet, is Uranus at a distance from the Sun of 19.2 astronomical units. That's 2.8 billion kilometers. Uranus was the first new planet to be discovered in 1781. And when I say that, before the discovery of Uranus, we knew about Mercury, Venus, obviously the Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, because they could all be seen with the naked eye. Uranus, you really hard to see with the naked eye, so it needed a telescope before it was found. It was William Herschel who spotted it in 1781. When he first discovered it, he realized that it wasn't a star because it was moving against the background of stars, and he first thought that he might have discovered a comet, but actually we now know it as the planet Uranus. Now it's got a fairly similar makeup to Jupiter and Saturn, but unlike Jupiter and Saturn, there's a lot more water methane and ammonia in the atmosphere. It's still a gas planet like Jupiter and Saturn. There's no solid surface that you could go and land on, um, but there's more water, methane and ammonia. And it's the methane which is present in the atmosphere of Uranus that gives it its really distinctive blue color. Now something else that's quite strange about Uranus is that we think at some point it's been knocked over onto its side. Now we can see that all the planets rotate on an axis. The Earth spins on its axis once every day, and most of the planets are all pointing in roughly the same direction, a bit like spinning tops on the floor. Uranus seems to be knocked over onto its side, so it's almost rolling around the solar system. And if we think that possibly at some point that a comet could have crashed into Uranus when it was much younger and knocked the planet over onto its side. Another planet very similar to Uranus is Neptune. Now, Neptune orbits the Sun at a distance of 30 astronomical units. Massive distance from the Sun, 30 times further away from the Sun than ourselves. In fact, from Neptune, the Sun would be like a very bright star. The discovery of Neptune was quite unique because in 1846, mathematicians predicted the position of Neptune before astronomers observed it. Now, astronomers had been studying the orbit of Uranus as it was traveling around the Sun, and we were noticing that actually Uranus 
seemed to be wobbling in its orbit. And it was thought that perhaps the presence of a large planet further out in the solar system with a gravitational pull could have been tugging on Uranus. And by studying how it was moving and where it was moving when it shouldn't, mathematicians could calculate where this other planet was going to be in the sky. And it was predicted by Urban Le Verrier and John Cooch Adams. They predicted the position of this new planet and astronomers found it exactly where the mathematicians predicted. A wonderful way to discover a new planet. Now Neptune is very similar to Uranus. There's lots of methane in the atmosphere of Neptune which gives it the distinctive blue color. But something that Neptune's got that Uranus hasn't got is a spot. Jupiter has. Jupiter's got the great red spot, this large hurricane system. Neptune has got the great dark spot, another hurricane system very similar to Jupiter's hurricane system. This one was discovered in 1989 via the Voyager spacecraft, but by studying the movements of clouds around Neptune's great dark spot, we've discovered that the strongest winds in the solar system are to be found on Neptune. And the wind speed there has been clocked at traveling 2,000 kilometers per hour. Which planet would float on water? The answer is Saturn. What's the nearest star to the Earth? The answer is the Sun. What's the name given to the event marking the start of the universe? The answer is the Big Bang. Well, that's it for our solar system. But what's beyond? Well, once we've left our solar system, we enter a region of the galaxy called interstellar space, the space between the stars. And the nearest star to our own solar system, of course the sun is our truly nearest star, but beyond the solar system, the nearest star is called Proxima Centauri. It's a star that's 4.2 light years away. Now a light year is a term that you've probably not heard before. I mentioned it a short while ago, it's the distance that light can travel in one year. And light travels 300,000 kilometers every single second. It's pretty fast. You try running around at that speed. So one light year is equal to nine and a half trillion kilometers. And we use it simply because it makes the numbers easier to handle. So Proxima Centauri, 4.2 light years away, that's the same as 39.9 trillion Kilometers. And as you can see, 4.2 is a lot easier to work with. The distances between the stars really are vast. But among them are gas clouds. Gas clouds where stars are forming. Stellar nurseries where stars are being born. Now these gas clouds, we looked at them briefly earlier, these gas clouds are made up mostly of hydrogen and helium, but they've got other elements in them as well. Even some have a small amount of alcohol inside them. Now the different gases, such as hydrogen, helium, and even alcohol, have many different properties. Helium, for example, like the balloons you have at your birthday parties, they have helium inside them, which is what causes them to float. Helium is a gas which is inert, and it means that the gas doesn't burn very well at all. Hydrogen and alcohol, on the other hand, do burn very, very well. A wonderful demonstration of how well alcohol burns is called the whoosh bottle, where we pour small amounts of liquid alcohol inside a large bottle, shake it up to produce alcohol vapor, which is a little bit like a gas. And as you'll see, when we set fire to the alcohol vapor, it burns and it burns with a wonderful blue color. And we get a fantastic whooshing noise as the gas and the flame escape from the bottle. Well, we've seen already how stars form in these gas clouds, and a brilliant example, as we've already seen, is the Orion Nebula, called M42. And if we look at that through a good pair of binoculars, and certainly a bird-watching telescope, you can see that there are some stars inside this 
glowing cloud of gas. It's called a trapezium, and these are the young hot stars that are being created out of those gas clouds. Stars tend to form in groups or clusters, known often as open or galactic clusters. And a brilliant example of a galactic cluster or an open cluster is called the Pleiades star cluster or the Seven Sisters. And we can see that in the constellation of Taurus. It's at a distance of 446 light years away. So it takes 446 years for the light to get to us. You can easily see it with the naked eye. When you look at it with the naked eye, you'll see about seven stars. In fact, the Romans used to use it as a test for your eyesight. But in reality, there's not just seven stars there, there's around 3,000 stars. If you look at it in a picture, as you can see now, then the stars look young and hot and blue in color. And it also shows a little bit of gaseous nebulosity. But actually, it's not part of the star cluster. It just so happens that there's a gas cloud drifting through that region of space where the cluster exists. There's another type of cluster as well called a globular cluster. The galactic clusters we tend to find inside galaxies, the globular clusters we tend to find around the outside of galaxies. And my favorite example of a globular cluster is M13 in the constellation of Hercules. Now there's about 3000 stars in the Pleiades star cluster, but in the M13 Hercules cluster, there's an estimated one million stars and it's at a distance of 22,180 light years away. Now just think about that. You probably need a pair of binoculars to see it in Hercules, but if you can pick up the Hercules cluster, then the light has taken 22,180 years to get to us. That means that when you look at these objects in the sky, you're looking at them as they were in the past. Everything we've talked about so far exists in our own galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. And if you look at the dark night sky when the moon is out of the way, you can see a band of light stretching across the sky. That's the light coming from all of the stars in our galaxy. Beyond our galaxy are more galaxies. Between them is intergalactic space, the space between the galaxies. And there are millions upon millions of galaxies in the universe. They come in different shapes and sizes. Our own galaxy is pretty average. It's, our galaxy is classed as a spiral galaxy. If you can imagine two fried eggs stuck back to back, then that's kind of the shape of our galaxy, where the yolk of the egg is the nucleus, the core of our galaxy, and then the spiral arms of the galaxy are where the whites of the egg are. Brilliant example of what we think our galaxy looks like is the Andromeda galaxy, which is just over two million light years away. That means the light takes two million years to get to us. You can see that with the naked eye, which means you can look back in time two million years. But galaxies do come in other shapes. There are oval or egg-shaped galaxies, a bit like a rugby ball, and there are also barred spiral galaxies. So it's galaxies like spiral galaxies like our own, but they seem to have a straight bar across the middle. And we actually think that these different shapes of galaxies are something to do with the evolution of galaxies because spiral galaxies tend to have lots of new young stars. Elliptical galaxies tend to have lots of old stars in them. Barred spiral galaxies tend to have a little bit of a mix. So we think spiral galaxies are how galaxies tend to form. They then change shape into barred spiral galaxies and then ultimately shift to elliptical shapes. Now, as we study galaxies, all around the night sky, we found something really quite remarkable, and that is that all of the galaxies, well, most of the galaxies, seem to be moving away from us. Now, that's not to suggest that we're at the center of the universe, although we did once think that we were at the center of the universe, but instead, it actually means that the entire universe is expanding, and a great way to visualize this is to get yourself a balloon. If you've got one around the house, go and get one now. Draw some colored dots on the balloon, and then blow it up. And as you blow it up, watch the spots on the balloon. And what you'll see is that as the balloon expands, like the universe is expanding, then the spots on the balloon all seem to be traveling away from every other spot on the balloon. Doesn't mean any particular spot is in the middle of the balloon, but it actually means they're all traveling away from each other. And in the same way as the spots on the balloon, 
we can see that all of the galaxies, most of the galaxies in the universe, are all travelling away from us. But that's not the case for all galaxies. Galaxies like the Andromeda Galaxy, which is a member of our own local cluster of galaxies, are actually moving a little bit differently. Now we've learned about the movement of galaxies all seeming to rush away from us here in the Milky Way by studying the light in an effect we know as the red shift. Now you've probably seen something a little bit similar to that with sound called the Doppler effect. Now I'm sure you've heard uh, a police car or an ambulance heading towards you and the sound of the siren is different as it heads towards you compared to when it heads away from you. That's because the sound waves all get squished up as it's traveling towards you and then stretched out as it's heading away. And if we look at galaxies, effectively they look a little bit more red when they're heading away from us and a little bit more blue when they're traveling towards us. And if we measure how much their light changes, we can work out their speed and we can therefore work out how far away they are as well. And if we apply that same logic to all the galaxies we can observe, we can actually work out that at some point in the past, 13.8 billion years ago in the past, they must all have been in the same region of space. And that marks the moment of the Big Bang. So we think the universe started 13.8 billion years ago in this moment, this event called the Big Bang. And when the universe started, it was full of hydrogen and a little bit of helium. And that was what ultimately created the stars. Now we've already seen how you can set fire to alcohol, but hydrogen is even better. Hydrogen burns really, really well. Uh, if you've seen a rocket launch, either on the television or on the internet, or maybe even been lucky enough to see one in real life, then you've already seen how well hydrogen burns because we use hydrogen as rocket fuel. If you mix hydrogen with oxygen and set fire to it, then it produces a phenomenal amount of energy. But what about the end of the universe? Because the universe will end at some point in the very, very distant future, but we don't know exactly how. It depends to a degree how much material is in the universe. The universe is expanding, it's getting bigger. If there's enough material and therefore enough gravity, then the gravity might be able to pull on the expansion enough to slow it down and maybe even cause the universe to shrink. Alternatively, perhaps if there's not enough material, the universe could keep expanding on forever. What we actually now think from studies of supernovae, which are stars which have exploded at the end of their lives, we now think that instead of slowing down the expansion or letting the expansion just continue forever, we now think that the universe is expanding faster now than it ever has before. And we think it could be continuing to accelerate in its expansion and getting bigger and bigger, quicker and quicker. But you know what? We still can't be sure how the universe will end. In fact, that's one of the things I love about astronomy is that no matter how many questions we seem to answer, we seem to reveal a whole load more questions that we need to understand. But maybe, and I hope some of you have enjoyed this virtual tour of the universe, and maybe some of you have been inspired to get outside and look at the wonderful and amazing universe above our heads. Thank you.